Hi everybody and welcome to the AIN Big Topic. I'm Paul Z. Jackson and we don't get any bigger topics than the one that we're going to be dealing with today and it's my pleasure to introduce Beth Boynton. Um, I'm going to show her book Medical Improv. Excellent book and um, Beth is going to talk to us on that topic and bring us up to date in current circumstances for up to the next 90 minutes. So welcome Beth, it's all yours. Thank you Paul. Um, nice to see everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, correct, with my and then I'm going to find my slides and then we'll be off and running. So. Can you all see those slides? Um, so Paul, I just lose myself when I, and I can't see everybody. Is it better to do it this way? We can still see everybody, at least I can. And I haven't seen your slides as yet. Okay. Hi, Catherine. Let's see, make sure I'm sharing my screen. Okay. That's it. You okay. started screen sharing and your slides are pulling into view. Let me, how's that? There we go. That seems perfect. Thank you. I get, I can get very stressed about technology. So I'm glad you're there and the rest of you are all patient with my limitations. Thank you very much. So um, let me start and just ask um, what you're curious about. Um, I have some planned things to talk about and share and um, be in dialogue with you, but let's just hear from you first, if that's okay. So we're still a small number and if anyone wants to unmute and just jump in, that's fine. If we get a few more people, then raise your hand, either digitally or physically. And you can also ask questions in the Zoom group chat, which is open, and we can monitor those as well. Also for comments and ideas and references as we go along, so we can build up a layer of other resources. And I th um, I'm not seeing the chat box now. I can see everybody, so I'm wondering, I'm gonna just go out and find okay i see it but i lose it when i go into full presentation so so while we're looking for how we get the chat box on top of the screen okay uh, steve has added a link to an article that is about leveraging improvisation to successfully adapt to disruption uh, it's a good article, I read it earlier, and recommend it. So that's the sort of thing you can put in the chat box as we go along. How are you doing with the chat box, Beth? I do not see it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll monitor that for you. Uh, drop in from time to time with the chat comments. Okay, so I think um, Steve's question about getting um, improv in with a disruption will come clear over the, over the course of our time together. Um, or at least as clear as maybe we can be at this point in time, knowing that there's not like a, a simple answer, but we will talk about it and we will talk about it. Um, other curiosities? Or, so I'll just dive in and trust that if you want me to stop at any point, you raise your hand or do a chat thing and Paul will guide us. So in our time together, um, your questions, I do want to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is the COVID-19. Um, most of my work is preceding that crisis, um, and yet it's such an um, international concern. We have to, I think we have to talk about it, and I do have some thoughts, so we'll see what how that mixes. Um, and I also think that even though it is an elephant in, a, in the room, the elephant has been in the room for a while. It's just got a, a slightly different name on it. Um, 
and maybe a, a, a more urgent call to action for those of us in applied improv. Um, I'll also talk about understanding healthcare, the culture, the dynamics, the challenges, give you some examples of um, how I'm adapting some simple improv into uh, healthcare situations. And that seemed to be a bridge to some really good ideas and brainstorming about your ideas and um, then a quick vision for us. So first, um, you know, healthcare, AIN, and now with that cute little picture of the virus. Um, I thought about this a lot. I reached out to a colleague of mine, Diana Crowell, um, who wrote this book called Complexity Leadership. It's a leadership book for nurses. She, she wrote the first edition. I co-authored the third. And I do want you to know, I forgot to say this earlier this morning, this has a section on medical improv in it as a leadership intervention. Um, it's a textbook. It's not like fun to read, but I think it will help us to legitimize the work in the healthcare profession, at least over time. It just came out in January. So anyway, I talked with her about how, how does this army of social skill builders, what can we do today? And um, our conversation, I think she had some great wisdom, and that is to, to ask healthcare professionals, what do they need? What are their concerns? Um, so my thinking is that everybody knows a nurse, everybody knows somebody or a doctor, somebody in their personal sphere of um, life, not as a patient, as a person, as a a regular old person. And if you can find a way to connect with that person who's currently working in healthcare and ask them questions like, what do you need? What are your concerns? What's it like for you? And sit with them and listen to that and validate it, which is part of the skill building we do in healthcare, that that could be an important beginning to modeling what, what listening is in a deep way and I think it will also serve to build a relationship um, with a healthcare provider who is going to be willing at some point when they're ready to be able to take in the value of the work that we do um, in a, on a deep level and in a meaningful way and that's I, I guess I just have to qualify that excuse me probably right now it's going to be even harder sell for team building because it's just to people don't have time. The reality is they don't have time. Um, so if we can make a relationship, model listening, and by the way, when we model listening, in a way, if I say, what do you need? And I listen to that, I'm actually helping to build assertiveness in other people. So leaders who ask that of nurses who don't necessarily have um, a good grasp on expressing what they need. They may advocate for others, but they don't know it for themselves. Um, that's a really good way to start to build assertiveness. Um, then I think we need to focus on using our work for play and stress relief. Um, and I know there's stuff popping up on AIN using um, virtual ways for playing. I don't know that healthcare professionals are gonna respond with to that with I have time because there's a tendency to be caught up in this constant reactionary mode. Um, and yet I also know you AIN people are very creative and um, that we may have to create opportunities for that and that it's just incredibly important. So keep doing the online dialogue about um, virtual play. We'll see where we can sneak that in. Then I think we have to be ready, probably already are, with skill building workshops and to consider that part of, excuse me, I pull out, yeah, um, part of being ready is to understand that we, I, this is Beth Boynton's personal philosophy, that as one system is falling apart, we are also building a new one. And so how can we, um, integrate our work into the new system and, and get it in at the very beginning. That's why in a way this is a really perfect time for, for this work and our work. Um, and so the places in healthcare to focus would be 
educational programs and continuing education, orientation programs in hospitals where new nurses are just entering the field or physicians are just starting their practice. Um, but also that I don't mean to exclude anybody that's interested. That's what I've been saying to myself for the past couple of years. I do not try to sell this work to people. Um, and yet I am very open to talking with anybody that's interested. So that's where the receptivity is and um, the readiness to embark on the work. So any questions or comments or more ideas from that elephant in the room piece? Uh, you've got uh, one question earlier when you're asking about questions okay. from Joel. Very interested in understanding how to approach improv remotely. And I would want to point out and welcome particularly Cheng or Caesar. Hi. Hello. Who has been absolutely instrumental in all of the um, online improvisation play sessions and conversations in China. Um, so you may have a few things to tell us about how that worked and indeed whether any medical professionals participated. I don't know if they did or not. Uh, anyone else that's got questions, then yeah, you know, raise yeah, your I hand or got, jump in. It's I've, got one, I've got one comment. Um, when you talked about kind of one system falling apart and building a new one, you know, frequently I think of healthcare institutions as very top down and autocratic. Mm -hmm. What are your perspectives in terms of how we might be helpful in terms of those kinds of things? Well, you're right, they are. And part of what applied improv provides is continual practice of pushing those limits to like rubber, what I call rubberize the hierarchy because of the sharing power that's fundamental in improv. Um, where we start, uh, we will. I think. I think I will answer that question as I go on more completely, Steve. Okay. It's complex. So I'm going to um, offer a definition. This is a little bit different than the one that's in my book. It's an emerging definition. Um, it's adapting the yes and philosophy and activities so that we can improve soft skills and critical outcomes. It's a broad definition and that's why I like it because any, any way that improv can be used to help us in any way with um, our outcomes and our skills, to me, that's medical improv. It's also applied improv in healthcare. What language you use is less important to me, um, but because it has become a thing, out there, it's good to have a definition. And I think what makes it particularly different is that soft skill and critical outcomes connection. If you look around online, you will find there's some different interventions. I think Belinda Fu and Katie Watson's definition is more geared to the field of medicine, um, which is great for the field of medicine. I think we need it everywhere. So that's kind of why I lean towards the broad, broader definition. So for, for applied improvisers to be effective in healthcare, I think it's important to understand a few things. And first is how do the soft skills that we build, and I'm talking emotional intelligence, um, communication skills, human interactive skills, teamwork, leadership, all the stuff we do, how are they related to um, key outcomes? And we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk, then I think it's important that, that you understand why it's so hard in healthcare to develop and practice the skills. And then third, um, how do we tweak the rules of improv so that they are most effective um, for the healthcare audiences? And there's just a couple places that it can be helpful to tweak them. So first, um, what are the critical outcomes that I'm talking about? And, um, and I will qualify that most of my work has been in the States and most of my research is in the States. However, in talking with other people like you guys in other places, I think the problems are kind of worldwide with maybe some differences and some different language. Um, but patient safety, number one, um, patient experience or customer satisfaction is another way to put that language. The health of the workforce and ultimately cost effectiveness. So those are the critical outcomes. I think that because we teach soft skills, they impact everything, um, but those are the big ones. So my, my next few slides, 
let's look at how are soft skills important in these critical outcomes. So first, why do soft skills matter in patient safety? Well, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. This has been a known issue for almost 20 years now, and um, I've seen the statistics bounce around a little bit, fifth place, first place, seventh place, but it, 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 medical errors are a huge, huge problem. Statistics in this country are as high as 100,000, I mean, 1,000 1, deaths per day because of error in the United States. Um, that's the highest number I know, but it's a legitimate number, and I'm happy to prove that anytime. Um, and, and importantly, underlining, underlying those causes of those problems, the most common reason we're making mistakes, there's three areas that show up. It's communication, it's leadership, and it's human factors, soft skills. So we have this huge problem, and the underlying um, persistent, chronic, pervasive reason is the soft skill factor. And it's still true um, even after 20 years of trying to fix it. I've, I've been teaching improv in healthcare when I got my master's was around the turn of the century. And that was around the time that um, I was also taking improv classes and um, building a consulting business on teaching communication because we were starting to see how important it was. A mention of the neuroscience that will come up later is that um, we know the fight, flight, or freeze is that it's harder for us to access our, our critical thinking when we're stressed in the healthcare environment. And so we can make, we can have um, a knowledge base that we can't get to if we're so stressed that we can't think. And that will make more sense eventually in, in the environments that we work in are often, often um, intensely stressful. My opinion, we're not getting at the roots of the problem. The roots of communication problem and human um, development in a way that's effective. We've been trying to, but not successfully. Questions out there so far? Shall I keep going? Steve has a question. Oh, keep going. Thank you. Uh, so what, I have a question. Uh, uh, Beth, uh, in, in China, like uh, especially in Wuhan, like uh, in quarantine time, in the peak time, uh, like uh, February, uh, we know that uh, the patients are crowded in the hospital and they're quite big tense between the patients and doctors and nurses. So that's what you mentioned here is that uh, like uh, communication and uh, how to release their, relieve their like uh, tension and also pressure. Mm -hmm. that, that's the case. Yeah, I, I, and I, and I want to, I hear you. Um, it sounds like a huge issue. Um, and I want to have an answer for you, Chang. I think that um, it's this place between the difference of preventing that kind of tension um, that our work is very helpful in preventing it because even to the extent that we learn to identify social cues better as a nurse, if I, if I can read that body language better through practicing improv, I can de-escalate. Um, so, and yet if, we're, if, if I'm trying to help you answer a question with a situation where it's existing right now, I'm not sure how helpful that will be right at this moment, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and then I go back to that um, what can we do right now? You know, listen to the healthcare professionals that you know, have conversations to build a relationship, and then maybe you're creating the conditions where the teaching can be more effective. It's like, I think sometimes of violence, like preventing violence is one thing, containing it is another. You know, our, so I hope that's helpful, and I wish I had more insights for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's a couple of other questions, Beth. Sure. Um, oh, Yepa, if that's the way to pronounce it, uh, has one. Do you want to speak your own question? Then I'll come in with mine. You need to unmute. That's it. Can you now? Hello, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Yepa from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. 
Um, I wanted to pose the question, how do you find that medical improv relates to the medical simulation tra uh, tradition? I find that uh, I just uh, started in healthcare uh, this month, I have a background as an actor and facilitator, and I find that there's a, a long and very strong tradition to using uh, these kinds of methods, although it's uh, uh, termed in a, in, they use different terms, uh, but uh, but the medical simulation uh, tradition, I think, is really uh, strong in this uh, in this area. So I'm just curious how you find that medical improv relates to that uh, to that tradition, because I see a lot of links, but I'm curious too. Yeah, well, I, there are a lot of links. Um, I think it's a matter of the healthcare system, like what medical simulation is for some that might not know is like this, these are the programs where we practice um, clinical, like practice a code or practice a, a starting an IV or whatever um, situation in healthcare, they're created so that um, students get to practice or practicing or, or clinicians get to practice. Um, they, I think, what we need to do in terms of improv is to create opportunities where the very fundamental skills are being built first because this, there are elements of personal growth that don't, they probably do get um, some opportunity for growing in the typical med sim issues people will learn oh i should have thought of that or i should have said this under that situation the problem is from my perspective that they're very clinically oriented um, and so that's good i shouldn't say that's necessarily a problem what's missing is this deep personal growth of learning to be more assertive and learning to be better listeners um, and i think i have some good examples of of that so it's like it's like <laughs> we need to insert this work as a precursor to that work. That as relates to my question, which is, as you've shown, communication is indisputably important in healthcare. And we also know that applied improvisation can raise communication skills and, right. and more. So how can our network, AIM and applied improvisers, do more to enable these two worlds to meet for mutual benefit? where and how are we already successfully making those connections? I'm not expecting you to answer that <laughs> straight off the top of your head, but I think that's a good question for us as a community to be addressing and exploring. There's a clear need and a clear offer, yes. both of which I think are not disputable, but they're not coming together as much as they might, as far as I know. Absolutely, and that is, is, is an incredibly important question. And I would say, um, at least as a beginning, is that the establishing the relationships and as as more as familiar as ap applied improvisers can be with what they what the dynamics are, so that bringing the work into healthcare will be like from an informed place. The more informed we are, I think, the more effective. I think an applied improviser can walk into a room full of nurses and have a positive effect. So it's not like you have to do it, but I think that you will have a more, a bigger impact if you understand the dynamics and the nature of the work. So yes, let's ask that question and let's talk about it. And I would be very happy to be a resource at any time. Um, somewhat helpful. Thank you. Now. Keep thinking. Um, so patient, so another critical skill a critical outcome that soft skills can help is patient experience, customer service. We know from evidence that clinical outcomes are better when people feel that they're engaged and empowered, that they feel heard. Um, so teaching listening skills, one of, which, one of the ways to do it is to model them, um, is extremely important. And so, you know, it's funny, you know, the activity, same time story, also known as a story mirror where one person talks and the other one says it at the same time. I use that as, as a listening activity. And I had a nurse tell me once when she did that, that was the first time she ever felt heard. And I was like, oh my goodness. It was like an awareness for me of where is that, where, is, where do we need to meet them where they are in terms of the skill building. 
um, because how do we expect somebody that doesn't know what it's like to be heard to be a good listener? So big moment for me. Um, so anyways, patient experience um, and soft skills, trust and communication are also very important in the placebo effect. And that's that take a sugar pill and you have, there's a 30 to 35% um, improvement in your symptoms in many situations. So we don't really know what that is. There was a good episode on Hidden Brain a few months ago that had some good examples in healthcare about that might be worth um, Googling and listening to, but ultimately we know we build trust and improve communication and positive relationships and improv. So that will, if we can help healthcare professionals be better there, they'll automatically be better in any therapeutic relationship. Um, we also know that patients and families are becoming more vocal about what they want. So that this again raises the point of how important it is for healthcare professionals to be able to listen and um, communicate with folks so that we are hearing them. One of the most well-read uh, articles on my blog is called um, The Importance of Listening in Healthcare. Unfortunately, I did not write it. It was written by Aline Nits Nitsky, but I'm seeing that, like more and more people are, are watching that. So in a way, Paul, I think, hmm, maybe there's at least an interest in the soft skill um, going on out there. And be by the way, uh, before, um, this COVID-19 nightmare or, or exciting opportunity or both um, happened, I was seeing a trend of more inquiries for applied work, so uh, uh, medical improv. So I think, I think there's some energy shifting. And ultimately in the United States, hospital reimbursement is dependent on survey results from patients that and many of the questions in our survey have to do with um, communication. Did you understand the medication that you were given? Um, was your doctor respectful? Those kinds of things. So we are starting to at least measure them. And the workforce, I'll break this down into physical harm and um, psychological harm. These are just some reality checks for you to know about. The data is from the United States. I would not be surprised that they are similar in other countries and happy to hear from you if you know um, that they are or aren't. Um, huge chance of being assaulted, doctors and nurses, more than a cab driver in an urban area. Um, up to a third of nurses experience back or musculoskeletal injuries every year. Work-related injuries are higher for nurses than construction workers. And so in, in, in these statistics that are interesting, there's the violence towards healthcare professionals, like for instance, somebody running into the emergency room with a gun, um, that kind of stuff, or somebody that's, you know, on, uh, going, I had a patient try to choke me once when they were withdrawing from morphine, um, that that's like patient to, to nurse, um, but there's also just the physical demands of the job itself that, that are, you know, moving patients around. And, you know, we can have protocols, but if there's not enough staff, I gave the example earlier um, of boosting a, a patient in bed, which really should have two people, if not more. Um, and if I'm in a room by myself with a patient that needs to be moved and they're crying in pain, um, something urgent is going on, and I'm yelling out, to I need help, I need help, but we don't have enough staff to um, come and help me. And so I try it myself and then I have a back injury. Then I go to the doctor's office and I get into the system with the healthcare occupational health and they're saying, well, what happened? You shouldn't have done that by yourself. And it's like, <laughs> so there's a staffing issue, which also is related. So, so the soft skill component are, we need to ask for help, which I did in that scenario. I need to be able to set limits, which I did not do. I could have said, no, I can't move you. I hear you're in a lot of pain and I wanna help you, but I can't move you till somebody else comes. Um, but also there's an indirect idea that the more um, healthcare professionals that are able and willing to speak up about what we can and cannot do and respect each other for those, those limits, that we will start to have a stronger collective voice to get more staffing. Staffing, has been an issue since I've been in healthcare, and that's like over 30 years ago. So 
um, the communication part of the, that seems to be indirect, but it is definitely there, in my opinion. And then the psychological harm, and we talked about this a uh, fair amount this morning, that um, there is a serious pervasive problem of bullying and emotional abuse in healthcare. Um, it tends to be, you know, there's the doctor to the nurse, nurse to nurse. The higher you are up on that hierarchy that you mentioned earlier, Steve, the more likely you're to see that abuse as, as, a, as a more aggressive form of disrespect. Um, if you're in nursing or uh, uh, home health assistance or in housekeeping, you might see it as more passive aggressive abuse. It's, um, you know, gossiping and undermining. In any case, the, the, what, what, what improv can do for us is to help us learn how to have respectful relationships, respectful communication. That's the opposite of all this, we are so creative as human beings to come up with all these different ways of being disrespectful to each other. Um, that, it, you know, so I, I, I see improv as a way to start to build um, healthy, healthy skills and healthy relationships. It won't help what Cheng's talking about right now in this moment, but in the long run, it will, I believe. And we also have, as you might expect, if we have all this bullying going on, we have burnout, compassion, fatigue, suicide. So there's a, a doctor whose job now or whose life's work is in helping doctors who are considering suicide because those statistics are growing up. Um, so, and, and you know, to bring this back to soft skills, um, you know, if I, if we talk about burnout, I need to be, as a nurse, I need to know how I'm feeling. So I have to have the self-awareness, that's an emotional intelligence piece. I also need to be able to express that in a respectful way, that's an assertive piece. I also have to be able to be expressing it to somebody who's able and willing to listen and validate me. It's another soft skill. Often what happens is if I said, oh, I can't work overtime, I might get a response, well, I worked overtime. <laughs> you know, or there's the door. So we're not really cultivating the skills in the way. And I'll say again, because the more I say it, the more I think the idea of, of having, finding a, a, a healthcare professional and modeling listening could really be one of those butterfly effects that has a system-wide effect in time. Um, so any questions about that so far, the critical outcomes? Oh, uh, yes. So I'm gonna invite Kethan to, speak he's come up with some research on the UK uh, some statistics on medication errors and so forth and also an example of where there's an opportunity for collaboration Kevin hi um, Beth I my, my stats were just to back up your stats basically no more than that but in the UK there are 200 million medica med medication errors in a year um, and uh, 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 you know, eighty thousand nurse injuries uh, into their backs every year in the UK, uh, which are related to work. And uh, three thousand six hundred are retired, forced to retire early. Um, but the example I have is um, just to give you my background. I help organisations with change and process improvement, operational excellence. So, one piece of work I did was in delayed discharge. So this is when the, the patient's medically fit, but uh, for all sorts of reasons, they can't be discharged. And those reasons are, you know, friend, a, a family and friend is not there to look after them. No one's there to issue medication. The, 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 the bathroom can't be, hasn't been adapted. There's no place in the care home. And what happens is because of a lack of collaboration, then often the people making those decisions, decisions make the most costly and maybe the least effective decision because they just need to move this patient on. Mm -hmm. rather than making the best best decision for the patient in, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a fuller picture. Mm -hmm. So examples of this, um, just a very simple example, is that um, if friends and family are asked to collaborate and asked, uh, for example, could you, could you turn up early in the morning before you, before you go to work and administer this drug to your mother? Um, and, and, and they say, yes, I'm happy to do that. Well, they can be discharged because someone in the morning will turn up and, and give the drug. But because those questions aren't asked, then people are moved into, uh, into holding positions, which actually don't suit them or anybody else. 
Um, and that I know for a fact because um, I've actually spoken to those care workers, you know, in interviewing them. And some of them are very good at trying to work out, improvise and try and find out the best solution, talking to all the different stakeholders. And some of them think, I just, you know, I just, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to move this patient on and get onto my next patient, you know? Um, sure. Yeah. So I'll pause that. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for sharing that, Keaton. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. That's a, it's a great example. I think it helps us to look at, well, how did that problem happen in the first place? You know, that the, 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 was our social system strong enough to support that person? I mean, that's like a, a complex, quite big question. Um, so that that person wasn't ready to go home. They, it, it's like a clinical, the clinical problem has been solved, but it's a social problem that's keeping in the, them in the hospital, right? And I think we're seeing that um, and have been forever. We, we, we have created a system, and I think that has to do with, um, I hope this is gonna make sense, because it does, <laughs> but it's like we, our system, healthcare providers, let, let's talk about nurses and doctors in general, but there's a lot others, have a tendency to go into that business because there are intrinsic rewards from helping people, from taking care of people. Um, now, if those intrinsic rewards are out of whack and become more secondary gains, like I'm in this business because I'm fulfilling a, an emotional deficit of some sort and I haven't addressed that, then it gets mixed up with um, clinical decision making. So, um, so here's, I'll give you an example on a small scale and then ask you to just imagine what it would be like on a big scale. If I'm a nurse and I'm taking care of somebody and we have a really nice rapport going on and I know that the, um, let's say I'm leaving that job. And so this, now there's this loss of the therapeutic relationship. If I have healthy boundaries, I'm gonna do things like, oh, I wanna introduce you to Margaret because Margaret's really a great nurse and I know you're gonna have a successful relationship and she's gonna be able to help you maybe even better than I am. Sometimes what happens because of those secondary gains is like we're getting something from the relationship that's not necessarily healthy, you know, in terms of being clinicians, that, that we're getting the secondary gain that might keep me from, I might think, well, that relationship is telling me that I'm the good girl, I'm the good person. So I, we thrive a little bit on that. Does that make some sort of sense psychologically? So now think about, let's say doctors and nurses on a large scale, I'll probably get a lot of mail now if this people are watching this, but if there, is, if there is some element of secondary gains that are part of our decision making, that that can contribute to a system that's like this, you know, we're, we nurture the dependence. You know, we should, be we should be empowering people, but we nurture the dependence and then we resent it. You know, because we don't have time <laughs> anyway. So complex question, complex example, and um, hopefully helpful thinking. Keep going. Okay. I did not put in a slide, like I said, I would about cost effectiveness and soft skills, but I will just say that when we're not operating as a team and communicating, then we're doing things that and billing for things that we shouldn't. And I think your example, Keaton, that you just said, we're going to a higher price because we didn't have an effective communication um, in a more, much more simpler way where people are coming into appointments, but we don't have their records yet. So that, there's a communication issue and the appointments wasted, everybody's time's wasted. People get resentful because we don't have the time to waste so on and so on and goes. But there are billions of dollars that get, get wasted in this country because of um, things we do or don't do that we shouldn't be doing that have a communication element. So what makes healthcare unique? Um, different from a business of maybe building phones or something. Um, not to say that those businesses aren't high stress, but here in healthcare, almost everything we do is um, urgent to somebody. And so there is like this chronic nature of uh, urgency that goes on. And I do also think that sometimes our secondary gains give us like, this helps us to avoid doing some of the work that we should be doing. Um, 
but also the high stakes. Um, if we make a mistake, a simple mistake could lead to a huge um, problem. And uh, I mean, a, that horrible outcome for somebody, all those medication errors, um, some of the sentinel events, they seem absolutely ridiculous that we would, um, in surgery, cut off the wrong leg or do the wrong surgery on the wrong person. It seems completely ludicrous. I will show you an activity called overload in a few minutes, or we'll talk about it a little bit, but th this goes back to the higher thinking. Can we access our higher thinking um, when we're so stressed out? Um, and you might just make a side note to Google um, interruption awareness, which is it's a, a video from a few years ago where I used the overload activity to show some statistics, although they're dated at this point, but um, they do link to this, the high stress um, component and how we can't think in the moment. And, you know, now that I think of it, I'll, there's a um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, which is a fairly well-known teaching hospital, has a simulation department called Spartus. And um, the reason I'm bringing, up, bringing it up is because I'm going to be going down whenever we can schedule it to meet with the physician who's the director of that. And his name is Charles Posner. And um, I happen to note in his, in their um, annual report, a quote from him, and it is about re with respect to patient safety. He says, almost always the answer is in the room. And I think, that, and so he's in charge of the simulation department, what kind of ties everything together that we're not getting at the answer that's in the room partly because of stress and partly because of communication skills. He's, he understands the problem. I don't really honestly think yet, because we haven't gone deep into a conversation, um, understands that how deeply rooted the problem is in terms of social emotional learning. So that, and that goes back to that precursor question, yep, uh, and the medicine stuff. Anyway, we mentioned blaming and bullying cultures. Um, Soft skills is different from clinical skills. Most healthcare professionals, even the educators in healthcare, tend to be um, really good at teaching how to start an IV or what are your, what's the anatomy and physiology. They're much more intellectual um, things, even though there can be a hand-eye coordination issue. It's not the same as the personal growth for developing um, self-awareness and self-confidence. Um, the ability to see another perspective. Those are the kinds of soft skills that improv is like so golden for um, that we so need, um, but it's different. So we don't get that much exposure to it. I'd like to say a minute, talk a minute about the emotional risk in this personal growth. Um, as, and this is on both sides, um, listening and speaking up have an emotional risk that's often either undervalued or un not understood or just not even known. When I'm learning to be assertive, and that's been part of my life work as a person and, and as a mom and a nurse and per whatever, to take the risk of saying an idea or a concern means I'm making myself be more accountable. I'm putting myself out there in a place that can feel scary to me. On the other hand, if I'm learning how to listen, I'm learning to let somebody else in on the equation. And that there may be liability issues that make that even more complicated. But again, there's an emotional risk of letting go in sharing power. So I think that's one of the reasons why, even though we've been trying to improve communication, we haven't gone down at a depth that has helped us to learn how to share power, which we all know that improv is amazing, um, pro provides amazing opportunities to do that. Team composition is changing all the time. And those of you that work in team development know there's a process. Anytime people come and go in the team, the process begins and ends again. This just makes it be like this constant ongoing change. Um, I probably already made the point that we have, don't have experience sharing power. That's in the, in the um, hierarchy that it's kind of top down and not more wishy wavy that it needs to be educational programs. I, my, one of my books is a, another, a different textbook. It's Successful Nurse Communication. is a textbook, textbook for nurse communications. One of the challenges in selling that book is that many nursing programs do not have courses that are, for, that are just for communication. And the reason for that is that their curriculum is so packed with clinical stuff that we don't have time to focus on it. It's not a, 
I, I don't offer it as an excuse. My answer is make the time, but that's the reality. Um, also, I think it's, we need to know that patients are vulnerable. Um, they could be intimidated by the power dynamic and they have a range of, of dependency. Some people, an older person might come in who's been taught all his or her life, oh, do what the doctor says. So we think that that, so how do we empower that person versus how do we um, empower somebody that comes in that, in that may actually know more about their diagnosis than we do. It's an interesting dynamic healthcare. My feeling is healthcare professionals need, be, need to be able to respond to this continuum of um, dependency while always shifting towards empowerment. Um, also, leaders need to be collaborative and directive and be able to shift between the two of those. And I know that you know how wonderful and how uh, many activities can help build those skills in improv, um, even the simple ones with mirroring. Um, it's important because we, in the hierarchy, we have people at the top that are used to just being directive and people at the bottom who are just used to being, you know, following the rules. When in reality, we need those people at the top. The doctor needs to be able to, or the nurse, whoever's in charge of the situation, needs to A, be able to um, direct a clinical decision making at the same time that they are receptive to getting input so that the housekeeper can say, hey, wait a minute, um, there's, there's blood on the floor, or the nurse can say, hey, wait a minute, that's the wrong leg. We have to be able to be able to do both, not just one. Questions on that stuff or comments? There's, um, <laughs> I'm writing some stuff about mistakes, which is one thing. Um, then. I've noted some points about this really interesting question that improvisation may have some answers to of how healthcare professionals shift from patient dependency or staff dependency towards empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, Ketan says here in the UK, GPs are often asking first, what did you read on Google when the patient is presenting in order to connect with the patient? Right. And um, I've mentioned that improvisational activities almost all have some element that illustrates a non-hierarchical way of working and collaborating, mm -hmm. which we'll see in your examples later, I think. Yes, yeah, and I think that's a great example of community, that's a great empowering statement. To walk in the room, you're showing that you're confident, um, you're in your role as, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what your role is, but some sort of a healthcare professional, and you're saying, what have you learned on Google? So you automatically build a relationship. You're starting to build trust by saying, I want to know what you know. My information really is not going to be helpful uh, unless I, we, we have a relationship, and hey, maybe I'll learn something. It's, it's, um, a, it's, a, that's a confident place to come from. Onward. Um, I'm going to say just a couple of things about the rules, and I'm sure we all have different rules, and the rules that I have in my book, I sometimes use all of them, and I sometimes just use yes and. But there are a couple that are worth mentioning in terms of um, the difference between health using um, applied improv in healthcare. And one is um, I don't celebrate failure. And the reason for that is that creates such an emotional um, reaction with all of the mistakes and all the pressure we have to do things right. Um, I tend to use language that's let's celebrate risk taking. We're human, we make mistakes, so you can get that in there. Um, and that actually helps create conditions so that instead of a blaming culture, granted it may take years <laughs> to get there, but instead of a, a blaming culture, we're creating a culture where um, it's okay to, to be wrong. Um, and that can be pretty scary if, if what you did was wrong, um, caused a big problem for somebody. But anyway, it's just, it's a language thing. It's my preference. Um, avoiding questions. I've seen some improv instructors um, use that rule and some don't. And I've come to learn that if I'm working with a group of nurses or, or women, if it's not um, healthcare specific, I am more likely to use that role. And maybe you guys have seen this as well, I'd be curious, but I know that <clears throat> if I'm building assertiveness, if I'm with a group that needs to build assertiveness, 
they need to not ask questions because asking questions gives their power away. Instead, they need to ask questions. I mean, to they need to make statements, declarations. I, I think you know that. Um, but if I were dealing with a group of, of physicians, uh, I might not use that rule at all. Um, in fact, I might say it's okay to ask questions because that is part that can create an environment for making room for other people, part of a listening of moving over and sharing your power a little bit. So it's, just, it's a little dicey in terms of when I use that rule or not. I find that um, healthcare professionals need to be nudged to say, hey, you know, it's okay, you can make things up. And that's just, uh, oftentimes, we're so, you know, our clinical brains and intellectual brains are trying to say the right thing um, that we don't have permission. It's just kind of, you know, say, just relax, you can make it up. Um, and lastly, I added this rule, observers play an important role because, um, a woman in one of my classes, a psychologist, um, was terrified. She was so terrified of um, doing improv. And I do non-performance. Um, I guess that, that word can sometimes performing is, means different things to, I do improv for people to play and grow. She said, she came up to me after she said she just couldn't do it, she was so scared. And it made, got me to start to thinking that there are people sitting around in the room that are much more afraid than I realize. Um, and so in new, new um, classes, I usually say it's okay to watch. I ask that you um, participate in a debrief. So I give them a role to you know, pay attention and notice what you, whatever the context is, if we're learning assertiveness or tr we're building trust or diversity or whatever, be an active observer. And then maybe later on in the class, invite them to participate. So I give a little room for that. Um, do you guys, have you found that you use the same rules in healthcare or any thoughts on that? Well, people are thinking of coming in. I really support these things that you're saying that where applied improvisation thinks it can just take stuff from the stage and there's no adaptation to real life. Mm -hmm. We fall into all these horrible traps of, for example, celebrating mistakes, which is just completely inappropriate and is approachable within applied improvisation and indeed theatre imp improvisation by rewording things, celebrating risk taking, encouraging people to have a go, mm -hmm. being more aware of context, dependency of almost anything that anyone has to say. So some of these traditional <coughs> rules of improv, as soon as anyone thinks they're any kind of universal rule, leads to trouble. And you've got some great examples here of how you've modified what's coming there. I think part of what the Applied Improvisation Network should be doing is working out what principles do apply beyond the theatre, or even mm -hmm. better, without the theatre. Mm -hmm. So taking performance out as well, I think it's a great step. Sorry, I'm sure other people might want to come in on that. Just uh, raise a hand and jump in if you would. Yeah, this is Steve. I think I like the reframe there, Beth, in terms of celebrate risk-taking instead of failure. The other term I'm hearing now is, is for a long time in creativity and innovation, it was like fail faster. Now I'm hearing a reframe of learn faster. And that mm -hmm. seems to resonate better mm -hmm. with the, 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 world I, the world that I work in in terms mm -hmm. of manufacturing and those kinds of things. So I really like your reframe there. I like learn learn faster too, um, and maybe it's a judgment call for the for the vibe that you're feeling in the room um, a little bit. Um, I think because risk taking is is really where we're asking people to grow um, in terms of speaking up and listening. That it might. Yeah, be yeah, and I think that industry-wide, I, I, I like risk take, celebrate risk-taking better because the stakes are so high. So I, I like the idea of just reframing it. I can, I, I can, sorry, it's Joel. I can see how um, I really like the reframing of risk-taking uh, for in the business context. I don't, I'm not in the medical field at all. So this is fascinating. Um, how does How does that go down with people, the notion of, celebrating risk-taking in a med medical context, on the healthcare context? Um, 
with my work, uh, it's pretty good. Um, I think my skills at creating a safe environment to begin with and doing low risk activities at first mm -hmm. and then giving an example um, yeah. is, is a great way to kind of ease into that. And then people have the experience and I usually like you know, I might make a mistake and go, ah, 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 and then we all laugh and it's, so, it's okay yeah. to kind of create an environment like that. Uh, honestly, and another thought along that line, Joel, is that I think, I do think people want to learn and want to have these experiences. So um, as we make it safe, then the, there is a, a relief from it, you know, a natural human evolution going on. Yeah. Any other thoughts about the like principles or move on? Hi, uh, oh. Catherine here. Okay. Um, I, I really like this. It's great. In fact, I, I've instantly made some notes and I, I would have changed a couple of things in my own in sessions immediately. So thank you. One thing I was, one thing I have added to this, which I've started to do is, um, uh, particularly when I have a very diverse bunch of people is I've asked them to be themselves. And I know that sounds obvious. Why would people not be themselves? But I, I often say, just be yourself all the way. So for some, risk-taking is not about, uh, I don't know, if they're quiet, become loud. That's not what we're asking. Risk-taking is to, within the confines of where they are, to take risk, if that makes, make, makes yes. sense. So for, for, for me, risk-taking, I'm quite a, you know, I guess I'm an extrovert. My risk-taking made to sh shut up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And that's something, you know, often I, maybe I don't do. And that might be the risk I need to take is to just go quiet and let's see what other people have to say. So I think that's, for me, I, that's just a, just a point uh, to make, that's all. Well, it's a, I think it's a beautiful point because in, in the magic of improv, when you do that, when you have that awareness and you do that, your partner's automatically going to have the opportunity and maybe a nudge to speak up. So you're teaching each other while you're learning and you're learning different things in the same moment. And that's why I get like, oh my God, that's improv can help us in so many ways. I'll have an example coming up that will illustrate that in a video in a second. So thank you. Can I, can I add something into that as well, which is that, that risk taking that happens in the workshop is different from the risk taking that happens in your real life. So we're not training risk taking. Uh, what we're doing is training the uh, yep that, that point about psychological safety um so so it it's uh, and there's 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 plenty of research that shows that the, the more psychologically safe the environment the fewer mistakes get made i think there's a really interesting thing thing here about that there's there's an increasing amount of understanding that if you can get the uh, uh, your team working better and it takes soft skills to do that um, you're going to get fewer uh, errors uh, 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 and fewer failures, but getting people in the room is great, but then they end up going back into their, uh, into their everyday work and you've got the systemic uh, mm -hmm. uh, impacts that, 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 that can stop that. And it's almost like we're in this situation where everybody knows this is right, but how do we get past the systemic barriers to, well, hang on, no, you're just going to play. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a as a response because we're really busy and 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 it's a it's a thing which uh, uh, do, do you know the idea of square uh, square wheel syndrome i'm getting it from what you're saying <laughs> but so the, the, the square wheel syndrome is there's a guy pushing a wheelbarrow that um has square wheels it's really hard yeah and he's there's somebody comes running up with a round wheel mm -hmm. And they go, look, look, I've invented a round wheel. And he goes, go away. I haven't got enough time to look at that. And <laughs> it's a kind of, it, it, it's one of those things where if you can persuade people and, and get them to slow down, you can, uh, you can massively improve things. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a lot of what you've, you've, you've talked about today has been the, uh, the, the kind of, we need to get past that square wheel syndrome because nobody's going to disagree with what, what, uh, what, what we're saying, mm -hmm. um, but how do we get get past the system to allow it to happen? Well, um, I don't have. It's a great it's question. A no, and I, you know, <laughs> you're not expecting me to to answer it really. Although I do think that this is a helpful step in that direction 
because it looks at it from a, it's a systems, it's a leadership book for nurses with a mindset of how do we fix the system. And one of the interventions is improv. So, yeah. and it just came out, we're not there yet, but I think, so there's that, there's every time I think we model um, a skill we're helping. And what's, I, I guess I tell myself, um, just keep doing it, just keep going. Um, have, uh, just keep swimming. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be easy. We do have, we have what the healthcare system needs. I believe that intellectually, spiritually, physically, I guess, emotionally. So um, making that come about isn't gonna be easy. However, it's a good time, right? Because even though it's like this crazy nightmare time with the virus and everything all over the globe, it's also bringing people together and having conversations. Um, and as one system falls apart and another one is being born, we, we can be intentional, I believe, about uh, making sure this stuff gets into any new system from the very beginning. So I want to be very intentional about that. That's all I know. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Oops. So here, here's an example. Well, this is going to be an example of using an extremely simple activity called radical acceptance. You might know it as three things. I learned it from Jude um, Trader Wolf. And then when I started trying it, I saw, wow, this is really getting, helping us get to the depth of where the learning needs to be. And it's so simple here, but it's quite profound. So this is how the, the game is played. This quick clip, I'm gonna first make it big. Uh, slice banana. Yes. yes. Or a brownie. Yes. yes. Or a mountain of cookies. Yes. So, that's how the activity is played. Um, it's you pick any category, in this case it was dessert, and then you have this increasing um, responsiveness of affirmation. And I cannot underestimate or overvalue whatever, the, I, the, the value of doing this activity in healthcare groups is extremely important because it gives people a chance to see what it feels like to feel affirmed which might be missing. You might imagine it missing in, 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 in a system where blaming and judging and bullying are predominant. The feeling that affirmation from a group, while at the same time, the group is practicing to affirm their colleague. So it's a very fundamental. Um, and in terms of um, finding um, your voice, we're also getting to this place of Remember I mentioned earlier about the neuroscience of being able to get um, our, to our higher thinking and Dr. Posner's comment about the answer being in the room. This is where we're going to build those skills. I've done this, I'm gonna, and I'm going to give you an example in a minute, but I'm going to keep talking too. I've seen people do this activity and literally freeze because it's so hard, it's so scary. Excuse me, and again, so that's, that's, uh, that's feedback for me to say, oh my goodness, I really need to make this activity as safe as, as safe as possible, which I do by telling people you can say the same thing three times. You can say your name or the word pine cone if that's what you want. Um, I encourage the group to be patient so they are listening and then they are kind of practicing. So in this moment, um, uh, it, we're, we're diving into this um, human evolution of where fight, flight, or freeze exists, but we creating safe opportunities outside the clinical environment to start to practice to work through those um, impulses that limit our ability to communicate. So this in this next, um, this is the same activity, just somebody else doing it. And in these first few seconds, you're going to see um, what I'm talking about in terms of um, working through this, the deep rooted um, fight, flight, or freeze and finding her voice. So let's, let me make that bigger. Uh, uh, fresh, real, maple 
So did you see, were you able to see that first couple of seconds? Um, it's almost imperceptible. If, if, you, if you weren't looking for it, you might not see it, but it's like this, um, 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 strawberries. So you during, play it again, please? Play it again, sure. Sorry. No, you're welcome or whatever. <laughs> I love this moment. So th th that's a type of experience that if you were more extroverted, you might not even have that experience of what might have been hard for you in that moment was waiting to say yes. So we have an introverted person who's finding their voice, they're working through their impulse that keeps them from speaking up in an emergency to say that's the wrong leg or that patient's allergic to that or there's blood on the floor. I, my feeling is it's the same place, but what we're doing is creating safe opportunities to practice and with our peers. So what we get is a result of a positive experience. Meanwhile, the people that are, are waiting for her to talk they might be thinking say brownie or you know they might have an idea that they wanted to say so it's a very root it's at the very root of um i think human evolution and that's the place that we're not getting with um with the med sim departments that we already have we're not going that deep and we should um any thoughts about that or questions Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering what the rules are and how you may be set it up. But, oh, um, sure. Sorry. Um, it's basically you pick a category, mm -hmm. and it could be desserts. It could be fruit. Um, you say three things, and the group is to respond each time with more enthusiasm of saying yes. So it's the scaled enthusiasm. Sorry. So it's a rising enthusiasm each time. Yes, correct. And um, usually I, I will give an example. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sometimes will share. I remember a time when I was doing an open house with my friend Liz. She's in the Brown, teaches mindfulness. And um, we had an open house for our workshops. And this family came in with a couple of teenagers that seemed to be very shy. And we were playing this activity. And, one, and so they got in the circle. And you could just sort of see the anxiety and um one of the guys that was it was his turn and he said blueberries and we all said yes and he said blueberries again and we all said yes and he said blueberries again and so what i think he was doing whether he was conscious of it or not was he was help making it safe for the next person you know he didn't have to be perfect or create you know you didn't have to create cream brulee with you know, hot sauce or whatever. And so then what happened was this young man, probably 15 or 16, he did say something and we all said yes. And the grin on his face was like, I can see it. You know, it was like, so that moment for him gave him a social experience of taking a risk and getting a positive feedback that hopefully that goes in the bucket of, of social ex positive social experiences. See another talk, go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Is this, I'm not in my same screen, but I guess it's okay, right? Um, so this is another activity that has a lot of um, influence from improv and application in healthcare, primarily because once it's, it can be done fairly quickly um, and have a profound impact. Um, both things are important. How, what can we do in healthcare that's quick <laughs> and meaningful? And this comes from the status work. If you've read Keith Johnstone's um, or Kat Coppett's book, they both talk a lot about, um, they have some great status activities. So my friend Liz and I created this as kind of a, it's much simpler. Basically what it is, I have people um, in the room walk around in high status, give some language, um, and this isn't even in my book because it's so so new. Um, you know, act like you're superior. You know everything. Nobody else knows anything, and just walk around. We all, as human beings, know know what that feels like. Either because sometimes we act that way, or we have been acted like 
you know, I, we've had other people in our lives act that way towards us. Then I go to the other extreme. Okay, what's it like to be inferior? You don't know anything. Everything you say is useless, blah, blah, blah. People automatically, they know what those, those um, ways of being are. Then I have them get um, in pairs. So they're facing each other like you can see these two are. And we have one start out in high um, status or arrogance or whatever the um, terms, language you're using. I tend to stay away a little bit from status because that can be like a edgy point within the hierarchy. So just be creative around your, your language, superiority, inferiority. One starts out high, one starts out low. Over the course of like 30 seconds to a minute, they switch. And then I encourage them to come back to the middle and find a place where they feel dignity for themselves and each other. And I have done this several times with different groups and it is incredibly profound. It is a visceral reaction. People, they, when they contact each other and you can see it here, I'll uh, show you another picture that has a couple more. The different ways that, oh, that's, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. There's an example of it, but look at these different moments. These are the moments where we're finding dignity in ourselves and each other. And it is, oh, can give each other hugs, high five, shake hands. There's a lot of ways to express it, but we're either tapping into something that we know as human beings and have maybe forgotten or not used to expressing, or maybe we're evolving. I really don't know, but it's, it's quite profound. Would you like to see it? Um, I'll show you Liz and I doing it. Doesn't take long. Um, anyway, so that's, and, I, and honestly, I think if you can include that, try it with your non-healthcare. If you have groups that are more um, available for, for your work right now, not necessarily healthcare professionals, try it. Um, but it is a great way to start having conversations about these kinds of things, like how is a hierarchy and how can we relate to each other? If I have to be in a as a nurse, if I'm supposed to be in that leadership directive place, I can do that. But that doesn't mean I have to give up my humanity or my respect for you. Um, I did a, a cultural sensitivity workshop recently where I did not mention improv. This was for nurse assistants, but I did that activity early on. And then once they knew how to do it, I could like easily say, okay, just take a minute and do it and find the, the, um, the dignity with a new partner. And so I could sort of sprinkle it throughout the activity so, you know, you, you take 15 or 20 minutes initially, maybe a little longer for debriefing. People have a profound experience, but then you have something that you could use. A nurse manager, if I were doing train the trainer, which I see being more my, my career path is to help other people teach this stuff. If they were to do that activity, teach it once, then they could be doing that I'll, I'll, you know, the, at, at every clinic, every meeting, or maybe not every, so it doesn't get boring, but once every three months, they could say, all right, like, do that, find somebody that you don't know well, or that you, um, that's new, that, or just, just do it, because it's good to remember that we're human beings, too. Any thoughts about that activity? I experienced the activity in your workshop in the uh, Stony Brook AM conference. Um, I thought it was great. And then I've used it since Have in you? a couple of workshops. Yeah. Do um, you find it like it's like it's like this beautiful humanity moment? Yes. Um, it could be used as a a form of greeting in team meetings and that sort of thing. Um, and when people have an experience like that in a workshop, I think it's good to invite them to notice 
when they're having that dignity relationship in their work over the next few days. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it connects very much as well with solution focused mm -hmm. therapeutic stance of the client being the expert in their lives. Yeah. Just, a quick, just a quick question. Is this nonverbal the way you facilitate this exercise? Um, mostly. I'm a little vague with that with my instructions okay. as I often am, but it's like when I have people walking around in the high superiority, I, they may say a phrase or two. Um, okay. I leave room for that. Good. But it's Thank not you. about a dialogue. No, I really like this exercise. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I actually have a a sheet somewhere, a PDF that has like several, that has all of these different people on video, these one minute clips, if you want them, reach out. Sure. I, and I think you could use it in almost any, any team building or leadership. Um, and in fact, Paul, when you were talking about, it, it's like, this could even be, we could do it from six feet. <laughs> we can make it a social distancing thing. <laughs> or try it anyway. I love it. I love it. Hey Beth, I just want, first of all, this is great stuff. It's Christiana, thank you. And then um, I'm gonna actually, um, with that activity is I'm running um, some mental health groups online. All my things have moved online. Okay. And um, that looks like it'll transfer to an online activity very simply um, with the depth of perception of the screening, being able to lean in and just kind of give those ideas. So I'm gonna, um, borrow that and try that in a couple hours. I would love to hear how it goes. I have like a bias thinking that it would be really hard to do. And I think maybe that's just because I like to being in the room. So I would love to hear that will be a great blog post. Right. And I'm not, and I'm not excited about moving everything online. I'll tell you that I'm trying to find joy in it right there, but i um, definitely trying to create, you know, those nonverbal verbal communications because mm -hmm. as I'm working with um, clients, there, it, it's very interesting to watch um, the behavior when I get them on the screen right away. You know, we have to get over, we're watching ourselves, but then I decided to teach that into a, a teachable, or put that into a teachable moment where, oh, look, you can watch your body language online now and kind of assess mm -hmm. what information you're giving back. With my younger clients, they're doing a lot of goofy, you know, faces. We're, we're trying to get around that. And then with my older clients, they're feeling a little bit um, mm -hmm. held back with the screen. So I'm trying to go real gentle with, you know, how our body is sitting, how our tonality is and where our eyes are. And so that's a great supporter game. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I really, please, please let us know how that goes. That'll be, that's definitely going to be a blog post. Other, other feedback or thoughts? So we're like eight minutes. I'm going to zip along here. Um, Physical phone, um, this, I need some guidance on time management, Paul, and everybody. Um, I, I think people are familiar with it as an activity. Okay. And maybe if you show a few seconds, not the full five minutes. Okay. So um, just give you a little context. This is in New York. We've just talked a little bit about communication and making mistakes in healthcare. We'll watch Gary start it out and then I'll zip to the ending. Um, we'll see what happens. Okay, so you know how it's played. Let's see where we are. All right, so I think this is... Uh, this is about to be the end. There were probably 12 or 15 people in the line. And Gary and Nancy Mose from the Allen Alda Center are gonna show you what Gary started and what she ended up with. So 
this becomes, you know how to play, you know how it's like, and this is a group of people with a lot of theatrical experience. So I've done it with nurses. Their motions are often smaller, but you can still see the people adding and taking away. So this becomes a great um, activity to talk about um, communication being much more challenging than we realize. We think we know what we're doing, but we don't. We think we know that we're being understood when we're not. And the conversation can be, um, extremely helpful in starting to brainstorm well how can we make our communication better so this for me this isn't really about an intellectual experience as much as it is about engagement what are your ideas and so people will have ideas like we'll do teach back and slow down and you know ha have a check-in and so then I say okay now you can use all your ideas and do it again and oftentimes it's improved so it, people have an opportunity to to um, make improvements and hopefully they have a physical experience that lasts um, longer. And if you want to read more context, that um, eye-opening activity is a blog post with the full video in it. And you guys used that activity before? Okay. Um, and handoffs, I'll just mention quickly, notorious, that's a, maybe a United States term, but that is a place where there are notorious errors where we're giving a lot of information about a patient from one clinician to another. And here we're just trying to do three pieces of information, case in point. Um, I referred to this earlier, overload. If you Google um, interruption awareness, you can find the actual video of it. One person is, um, charged with counting to 100 by fours, which this person, Carla, she's a nurse, she was at, at charged to do, while somebody in front of her is um, acting as a mirror that she's supposed to follow. One person on one side, simple personal questions, person on the other, simple math. She's got her fingers here, probably at, she's at like 20, she's counting to 20 and she's already getting frustrated and anxious. And somebody says, how many children do you have? And she's like, two. So what I've seen in doing this is it um, opens up the door to experiencing and having a shared experience of how stressed we all are. We're all running around being so stressed. So we, we actually, it can be, it's funny because we're like, oh, I, that's how I feel every day. So it brings that up. It also, and Paul has some ideas I want to make some room for in a second, but it creates opportunities to have self-awareness about our stress limits. Mine are different than yours. Um, which gives us an opportunity to speak up and say, as I develop my awareness and my skill at expressing it. And meanwhile, hopefully we're also creating cultures that are more willing to listen um, and honor each other's um, limitations that we're um, doing all of that. And that it also creates a door for conversations around communication skills like delegating and setting limits and constructive feedback, which are great workshops in and of themselves. So this can be integrated. Paul, what was your comment earlier about? Um, I've put it in the chat as well. The, okay. the activity, if you allow people to say pause or to say stop, they can test their stress threshold, practice being assertive, and then have another go when they're feeling a tiny bit calmer and see if they can go further. So yeah. it's a, a really nice use of the group to improve your skills and awareness. Awesome. So we've got about two minutes. If there's well, some concluding things you want to ask or say, and then I'll say what's coming up next in okay. AIN world. Thank you. I will just say this one little vision thing and even in the midst of our crisis, it is, and it's a lofty vision, but I think the, the applied improvisers have a skill set that we desperately need in healthcare, um, as you can see, and that because healthcare also interfaces with all, almost all forms of human diversity, that if we, whatever we can get into healthcare, we will have a rippling effect for the world. So I, there, thank you. I appreciate everybody's questions and listening and everything. Wow, thank you, Beth. Um, I'm sure people are going to write a few things in the comments by way of thanks or appreciation. I encourage everyone to do that. And there's a round of applause from Joel as well. And would like to remind everyone that there's going to be lots more AIN online, both these big topics about once a month, <laughs> some 
AIN 60 Minute Socials, where you can turn up and talk about whatever's on our minds. And there's going to be a new series as part of these webinar programs on watching AIN videos and discussing them, which Angelina Castellini is currently arranging. So thanks all very much for coming, your questions and participation. Thanks again to Beth. Um, one more mention of her book, Medical Improv. And um, we'll see you all again soon. And there's her contact details if you want to get in touch. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you all very much indeed.